Well, fantastic. Uh, thanks everyone for, uh, for coming today. And I really want to thank the organizers for uh, uh, giving me this really great honor to uh, uh, pay uh, uh, respects to, uh, to Professor Bill Reynolds, who's obviously been a tremendous impact on, on my career and, and on many others. And um, as I get started, I kind of wanted to point out a few things that I learned just recently about uh, Bill. And one is that he hasn't always been an NMR spectroscopist. Turns out that uh, he started out as an inorganic chemist uh, using X-ray photography to study a metal amalgam. So, so that was pretty interesting to me. And this was back in 1962. But um, fortunately, he, uh, he he sort of gathered his his uh, composure and uh, quickly found his way back to uh, to NMR and the organic chemistry community. Uh, one of the neat things that I noticed about his very first NMR paper where he was describing the C13 splittings and some substituted benzenes was that he was already thinking about long range carbon hydrogen coupling. And, and obviously that was a recurring theme throughout his career. And uh, uh, to put this in context, in 1962, Gary Martin wasn't even in high school. So definitely he was a, a man before his time. Um, obviously, with uh, Bill's keen interest in, uh, in natural products, um, he was very uh, um, um, uh, appreciative of the value of uh, proton carbon uh, uh, chemical shift correlation and, and uh, ability to simplify those data. And uh, um, one of the really nice um, uh, contributions he made to this uh, um, part of the field was developing a uh, fully homonuclear decoupled uh, proton carbon uh, um, uh, HX uh, indirect um, uh, experiment or uh, 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 HX uh, uh, correlation experiment. And I thought this was really, really cool. And, and if you think about, you know, uh, this work was done back in 1988 and, and uh, could be extrapolated directly to the uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, pure shift HSQC experiment that I'm sure we're all using in our lab today that was developed by uh, uh, Lillard R. Padel, Ralph Adams, and, and others in uh, Gareth Morris's group in the UK. So definitely a, a direct connection there. Um, also, uh, Bill was um, sort of harkening back to his original NMR paper. He, he always um, um, saw the value in, in long range correlation experiments. And, and uh, uh, this uh, culminated in one of my all time favorite NMR papers called the uh, the flock sequence, which uh, for, for many of you who are aware, this actually was called the flock because it has a lot of bird pulses in it or bird modules in it. And uh, it was actually one of the um, papers that inspired me to, to think about pulse sequences and, and how they work and, and how they could be systematically improved um, in, a, in a very uh, rational fashion. And I and, uh, really appreciated uh, this paper, appreciated it, had a huge uh, impact on my career. And I think it also had a, uh, an impact on others as as um, eventually it led to the, uh, uh, this kind of work led to uh, Adbax's uh, HMBC experiment, the inverse uh, detected version of these uh, uh, long range correlation experiments. And I think, uh, at least in my opinion, it's probably one of the most impactful uh, pulse sequences that, that ever uh, arrived on the scene for the structure elucidation of natural products. And then of course, for my own career and, and, and Teo Perella and Joseph Sari and, and others, the uh, development of the HSQMBC um, uh, family of experiments certainly emanated directly out of this kind of work. Another thing that many of us know about Bill is that he was always very uh, um, uh, cognizant of uh, educating the new generations and, and uh, uh, had some amazingly uh, useful uh, reviews and tutorials and how-to articles that, that certainly helped to shape the way that, that I thought about setting up NMR experiments and processing data and, and I'm sure it's done the same for, uh, for many others and uh, uh, these have been really uh, amazing papers and as, as Darcy pointed out or someone pointed out early this morning, uh, they really make a huge impact um, and uh, uh, been super useful over the years. So thanks to Bill for uh, taking the time to do that. One thing I did not know about Bill was that uh, um, he was actually not only a pioneer in, in uh, NMR uh, applications and, and pulse sequence development, but he was actually um, a pioneer in the application of uh, quantum chemistry uh, calculations to uh, to NMR and and uh, actually found that all the way back in 1977 when I was about six years old he was already uh, uh, doing quantum chemistry calculations applying this to, to NMR related problems and and uh, I wasn't too uh, um, uh, aware of what kind of computing was available at the time but I imagine it was some sort of mainframe computer as shown here uh, this is an old IBM mainframe 
that uh, had uh, just a fraction of the computing ability that, that you probably have on your phone right now. So obviously this led to, to really great things like, like the development of uh, these, these amazing DFT platforms from Gaussian, Schrodinger, uh, the open source games and, and others. And certainly we're applying this in our everyday NMR work and I, and I know many others are to, 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 to great advantage. And finally, I just wanted to, to point out one more thing about Bill, and that was uh, something that was stated by uh, the late Alex Bain um, in sort of an intro to a special issue dedicated to Bill Reynolds, where he, he mentioned that, that the NMR technology had actually um, improved to the point that now we could actually use this uh, uh, methodology to non-destructively and uh, rapidly and unambiguously define complex organic molecules with no other information than the molecular formula. And this sort of ties into what I wanna talk about today and something that we've been working towards for, for quite some while, some time. And that is, if you're going to uh, assign a structure unambiguously, you really need to, to use some sort of orthogonal confirmation of that structure. And there's a number of ways to do this, including single crystal X-ray, the, the new developing microelectron diffraction, um, uh, electronic uh, circular dichroism, especially when tied into DFT methods, um, like uh, vibrational circular dichroism in, in the IR range, uh, the new and very exciting molecular rotational resonance spectroscopy, and then of course, anisotropic NMR, which uh, is something that, that we kind of fell into. We never intended to be uh, anisotropic NMR spectroscopists, but certainly we've been able to apply this to help solve a lot of different problems. And, and this really comes from the fact that if we can actually use these, uh, these uh, um, uh, NMR, these sort of alternative NMR parameters to, to um, develop a three-dimensional model using our NMR tensor information, then we can actually combine that with our computational power and we can develop a, a three-dimensional uh, map of this structure, which uh, um, and at least on the surface is, is uh, quite akin to what one would expect from an electron diffraction uh, map or electron density map from a single crystal electron or single, from single crystal X-ray uh, crystallography, excuse me. And so you can see the power of this is that we can generate three-dimensional structures or, or the goodness of fit to a three-dimensional structure. Then we can actually verify um, uh, structures from a pool of uh, potential candidates. Um, in order to you know, recoup these residual dipolar couplings or, or uh, uh, chemical shift anisotropy, which are uh, lost in an isotropic solution, we certainly need some uh, way to align these molecules. And one of the most popular is the uh, polymethyl methacrylate uh, polymer divide, de developed by uh, Roberto Gill and, and uh, really uh, capitalized on by, by many others, a very nice uh, compressible gel system so that once in a while our, uh, our, our molecules that's tumbling in solution bumps into this polymer and, and basically takes on an, an average orientation which is known as the uh, principal axis frame. If we know the principal axis frame then we can basically take any structural proposal and we can, can uh, take our uh, um, um, anisotropic NMR parameters and, and develop uh, certain relationships, like with RDCs, we can determine uh, relative bond angles between all of our proton and uh, uh, carbon, so uh, one bond proton carbon connectivity. And since we don't have any distance constraint, all these can be reduced to a single point. And they can then, as, as Kirk mentioned earlier, um, can be compared to uh, um, our, our, our calculated values, and uh, our calculated values can be compared to our experimental values. And if we get a really nice fit, is shown here in the upper right, then we know that we are on the right track for our correct structure. And if we have an incorrect structural proposal, you see here in the bottom right that things just don't fit very well. Um, there are other uh, ways of uh, actually fitting these data rather than this, uh, the traditional singular value decomposition. And, and I was really excited to, to be involved with uh, an effort uh, uh, spearheaded and led by uh, Marcus Wexteder's group where we actually was using um, uh, an approach called Payless 3D, which basically takes into account the fine structure of our alignment media with the, the, the structure of our compound of interest. And in these cases, we can actually use much sparser data sets and can be even more confident in the, uh, the, the, the actual assignment of structure from, uh, from these data. And, and I think you're gonna be hearing a lot more about that from, uh, from Zwickstetter's group, uh, uh, Tina Tile's group, and, and also some stuff that, that, that we've been working on with uh, Easy Lou. And so one of our um, sort of practicing NMR spectroscopists, one of our sort of driving forces is to, to try to make these techniques practical and uh, uh, more powerful in, in, in everyday use. And, and one of the things that we did some time ago was 
um, a couple of years ago was to um, look at um, actually um, aligning these molecules in, in a bit more of a uh, enhanced way. So basically providing stronger alignment for these molecules. So when we measure our values like residual chemical shift anisotropy, then uh, basically we uh, uh, can reduce our error and um, increase our confidence in, in these data. And, and uh, Kurt Gustafson showed an example earlier today how uh, we could actually amplify uh, these data with uh, his example with colomidine. And, and basically the idea is that if we add stronger alignment, then we can basically decrease, I mean, we can increase um, our uh, um, uh, alignment and um, um, basically uh, um, uh, amplify our, our uh, residual chemical shift anisotropy data or, or our RDC data. This is really nice too, because it actually makes uh, RCSA data um, uh, valuable for uh, sp3 carbons, which typically aren't too much use in, in a more weakly aligned state. Um, here in the, the, the upper right, you can see just an example on ret scene where we actually align this molecule in, in PBLG and, and we're able to increase our goodness of fit or a Q factor um, by a factor of about three. So. So really nice method and, and uh, we've been sort of pushing that and, and uh, trying to see how we can make it even uh, easier to use. Um, and applying it to some pretty complex uh, uh, systems. And so one, one uh, recent example was uh, um, basically revising the uh, uh, relative, config relative and absolute configuration of a compound known as formidolide. This is a compound that we uh, had actually assigned uh, many years ago based on uh, what was uh, then known as the uh, J-based configuration analysis. And it turns out that, that some of the rules that had originally been uh, proposed for this method um, um, kind of fell apart um, when you get into more complex systems. And at the time, we really didn't have any way of uh, uh, proving this and assigning the, the structure as is. And um, as uh, Ian Patterson and Robert Britton's group um, were, were doing some synthetic work on this molecule and Jorn Peel was looking at the biosynthesis, it sort of came to light that maybe something wasn't quite right with all of these uh, assignment of all these stereo centers. So we basically went and, and did a very uh, comprehensive uh, uh, computational and, and uh, uh, anisotropic NMR analysis of this molecule. And you can see even with a molecule this large with all these stereo centers and this, this big macrocycle, um, we were able to confidently assign um, the revision of three of these stereo centers. And, and we, we really feel uh, sure that we've got it right now. And, and uh, Ian Patterson and, and Rob Britton are hopefully going to wrap this synthesis up soon and, and uh, really bring closure to this uh, really, really uh, a tough problem. Other things that we've been doing to try to make these uh, uh, methods uh, uh, more accessible and easier to use were, uh, um, example is um, our uh, uh, recently reported uh, one-shot RCSA analysis. And so in this, this case, basically what we do is we um, 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 develop a, uh, um, alignment media uh, made up of uh, a mixture of uh, isotropic and anisotropic PBLG. So basically all you do is you take your, your polybenzyl uh, L-glutamate and, and add to your chloroform in, in incremental amounts. And it turns out that there's a relatively sharp transition point um, in concentration from going from anisotropic to isotropic. And if you stop uh, midway at that transition point, then basically what'll happen is your, your liquid crystalline um, uh, 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 PBLG will actually uh, um, be less dense and will form a biphasic mixture with your, your isotropic uh, um, or randomly uh, tumbling uh, um, PBLG. And so their molecule of interest will be diffusing freely between these two layers. And so we can actually acquire a C13 NMR spectra um, 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 simultaneously for both the anisotropic and the isotropic uh, um, species in this solution. And this is really great because we only have to acquire one uh, C13 um, data set um, is self-referencing because you're just measuring the distance between or the difference between these two chemical shifts. And it's really accurate because you're basically measuring them both in the same environment at the same time. And so no referencing is needed. It actually works out really nice. Um, this just shows the quadrupolar splitting for, uh, for chloroform um, in uh, uh, PBLG and chloroform. And, and this is quadrupolar splitting. And so you can see as we increase the, uh, the concentration of PBLG, um, in the solution from say 10.9 to 11.8, you can see that we're actually forming this biphasic mixture and we're getting a mixture, um, in this case, about one to one of a, um, a anisotropic versus isotropic system. And depending on the, the molecular weight of your starting PBLG, this, this point will actually uh, change a bit. It also changes a bit compared considering uh, whatever kind of analyte that you have. But 
Um, it's relatively easy if you're careful to, to stop um, and when you get this biphasic mixture. And uh, we actually demonstrated this on strychnine, as you can see here, we get these beautiful data. It's very easy to uh, measure the difference between our anisotropic and isotropic species. And then we took that on to, uh, to look at another natural product, which we actually thought um, had been, uh, whose structure we thought had been incorrectly assigned. And it turns out that the assignment was okay. It was just that the uh, um, uh, chemical shift assignment, the structural assignment was okay, but the chemical shift assignment was not. And uh, this is just a nice example showing that not only can, uh, can RDCs and RCSAs help to define molecular constitution, but they can also help validate uh, chemical shift assignments. And so you can see here with our corrected chemical shifts, we get a really nice Q factor of 0 0.066. And then if we actually flip some of these uh, chemical shifts as were originally assigned, you see that the, the Q factor uh, starts to fall apart a bit and uh, it's actually at 0 0.079. Um, in yet another application of, of this approach, we uh, uh, recently were looking at uh, some cannabinoids. We're somewhat interested in these uh, uh, molecules for their uh, um, sort of biological context. And, and we'd seen in a paper where um, one group reported uh, taking oxone and, and uh, CBD and, and generating a, an epoxide as shown here below and basically turned out that it was uh, some sort of uh, WNT uh, beta catenin uh, modulator. And so this was pretty interesting to us. And so we wanted to sort of repeat this work. And what we found was that NMR data that we uh, acquired didn't match up with an epoxide structure. When we went back and looked at the original data, uh, it didn't appear that their uh, uh, data uh, matched up with an epoxide either. And so um, after a little bit of work, we decided that this was probably the, uh, the ring closed uh, cannabial sewing. Uh, also known as CBE. It's actually a, a mammalian metabolite of CBD uh, with up to that point, no known uh, biological target. We also hypothesized that perhaps it could close in a six membered ring. And then it turned out in the literature, it was never clear exactly what the uh, uh, absolute or relative configuration of this uh, a tertiary alcohol center, the stereogenic center um, was either. And so we wanted to, to double check that. So I'll just uh, quickly mention that we took, uh, um, did our standard C13 chemical uh, uh, shift uh, calculations or did our C13 NMR chemical shift calculations compared experimental versus uh, calculated. And, and those also pointed towards uh, CBE as being the correct structure. But interestingly, it showed that um, in the alternative configuration at, at this uh, stereogenic center, this, this, this tertiary alcohol, um, this, this compound would actually form a boat conformation. And so um, our standard NOE or ROE um, experiments would be uh, completely ineffective at assigning uh, the stereochemistry there. And so then we actually used our one shot um, uh, um, RCSA analysis technique. And you can see here, this is just the native data and then the, uh, the data from the global spectral deconvolution. Um, really nice uh, way to uh, process these data. And you can see that uh, uh, once this uh, analysis had been done, um, we were able to uh, uh, definitively assign CBE as being the correct structure with a Q factor 0 0.068 as compared to a much larger Q factors for the other alternative structures. Another thing that we, um, in just the last few minutes we have here, another thing that we've really been interested in lately is um, the exploration of, of macrocycles. And it turns out that there's a lot of opportunity there, but uh, there's also some big challenges. And, and one of the projects that we've been working on is, is uh, rapamycin, actually uh, working with uh, some biotechnology partners to develop uh, uh, synthetic analogs or sorry, biologically um, uh, produced uh, uh, analogs of, of rapamycin. And uh, basically, we want to try to study how, how changes in the structure change the three-dimensional conformation. And so we can take a molecule like rapamycin and, and use in a, um, um, our, our um, our favorite um, um, conformational search engines like, like ForceGen, we can develop a, uh, what we feel is a pretty clear um, 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 and, and comprehensive uh, comp uh, um, uh, conformational space or a picture of conformational space for this molecule. And, and using ForceGen, we can either use conventional NMR constraints and, and uh, uh, basically find some low energy structures, the, the lowest energy structures, which, which are very homologous with the, uh, the structure of uh, rapamycin bound to its protein target FKBP. But we can also use anisotropic NMR parameters to pull these out directly. And so with just seven pieces of RDC data, we can actually come up with the same exact uh, low energy structures. Um, and so I'd love to talk more about this, but just wanted to kind of throw it out there and, and uh, talk about um, you know, some of the challenges with macrocycles and their, their conformational analysis. And, and definitely want to give plenty of uh, 
uh, props to uh, Force Gen and, and how well that's been working for us. And in the last couple of minutes, I've just mentioned one more macrocyclic problem. This was a problem that uh, popped up in the literature with our uh, friend and colleague, uh, Nick Erbelis and his group at UNCG. And they had isolated these uh, biz lactones from, from a fungus and, and uh, using uh, conventional uh, DFT calculations and, and uh, um, uh, chemical shift assignments, they were able to, uh, to uh, confidently assign uh, two out of three of the stereo centers. But one of the stereo centers remained ambiguous and, and uh, basically the, this uh, publication talks about how you know, the, the power and basic limitations of uh, you know, sort of standard DFT calculations. So we reached out to, to, to Nick and, and his group and, and sort of told them we'd like to take a crack at this. And, and our, our game plan was basically to just take this structure and uh, um, 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 submit, subject it to a, a more uh, in-depth and comprehensive uh, confirmational search using a variety of, uh, of commercial and proprietary um, uh, confirmational search engines or search platforms. And uh, then we would basically repeat these sort of DFT energy calculations and, and uh, NMR chemical ca shift calculations with a variety of uh, uh, higher level functionals and basis sets and uh, different combinations and, and then apply some custom scaling factors uh, to these data. And then we assume that we just validate our results with RDC and, and assign relative configuration and, and declare victory. Well, it turns out that it wasn't quite so easy. Um, when we completed this sort of stage of the study, we actually found that, that our C13 uh, NMR chemical shift calculations pointed towards uh, structure 1B, so one of uh, four possible diastereomers. Our, our proton chemical shift calculations pointed towards uh, 1C, uh, yet another uh, one of these uh, possible diastereomers. Our uh, SVD, which was um, obviously unstable and, and, and overfitted, um, was pointing us towards 1D, and then biosynthetic arguments actually pointed towards 1A. So we basically found that, that we, we uh, had four different approaches, which all pointed towards four different answers. So we wanted to uh, um, kind of revisit this and try to figure out you know, what went wrong and basically decided that it was clear that our, our populations, our Bolson populations were not representative of reality and perhaps we had missed um, some important confirmations. And, and it turns out that um, we expanded this search to uh, um, a much larger group of, of compounds. And it turned out that some of the confirmational search platforms that were specifically geared towards macrocycles were, were really important here. Uh, the other platforms did not identify the, uh, some of the important confirmers. And, and ultimately we generated about three to 500 structures. Um, all this uh, confirmational flexibility here sort of gave a very uh, big variation in, in uh, structural um, uh, uh, moieties. And so, um, we needed to, to, we couldn't do um, DFT calculations on all of these structures. And so we basically filtered them using um, just a few key uh, discriminating J couplings. And that, that sort of got our, our uh, confirmational ensemble uh, down to um, uh, maybe a dozen structures or so for each uh, possible diastereomer. And then we basically um, used two different approaches to uh, calculating energies in, in parallel, uh, uh, hoping to get a consistent result. And then once we got those results, we basically took these Boltzmann uh, weighted uh, NMR or calculations for uh, NMR observables, our C13, our, our proton, our, our N-bond uh, homonuclear proton, proton coupling constants, our long range carbon coupling constants, and then follow up by validating with our easy Rosie. And then basically wanna um, double validate with our RDC measurements uh, using a PMMA compression gel and, and sort of our standard SVD fit. Unfortunately, in this case, um, um, it actually everything worked out really nicely. Our, our, uh, our C13 uh, chemical shift calculations suggested 1A. Our proton chemical shift calculations suggested structure 1A. All of our homonuclear and heteronuclear coupling constants um, suggest uh, structure 1A. And then, of course, our RDC analysis also pointed towards this uh, 1A as being the uh, correct structure by a wide margin. And so uh, at this point, we're pretty confident. All of our uh, correlations from our Easy Rosie experiments, people that haven't used Easy Rosie, I, I suggest you check it out. It's uh, published by Tina Tile's group a few years ago. It's really, really nice um, uh, um, um, output of uh, relative um, intensity for your, your Rosie data and uh, definitely worth checking out. But all those uh, correlations were consistent. And I think at this point, um, it also fits our biosynthetic considerations, and, and we're pretty confident that we've nailed down, nailed down the uh, the structure of uh, diastereomer 1A here. So, uh, 
Um, we've got a few little things to, to clean up there, but, but I think we're well on our way to, uh, to wrapping this project up. So it looks like I'm completely out of time. I just want to give some thanks to uh, uh, my former Merck, uh, NMR team members and many of those folks, including Izu, especially Ryan, uh, Misha, um, uh, Joseph, Alexi, and, and Gary. Um, we're, we're involved in almost everything I talked about here today. Um, we actually have a vintage photo of our very own Yining uh, Chi Chen, who you heard from earlier today. Uh, Teo Perella, Laura Castanar, who helped a lot with uh, many of the things that went into this work. Um, of course, uh, some of our key collaborators, Roberto Gill and his group, uh, Kirk Gustafson, who uh, you uh, heard from earlier today, Marcus Wexteder, Armando Navarro Vasquez, Christian Griesinger, John Clardy, Emily Mevers, um, the whole Formidlad team, including uh, Bill Gerwick, who you'll hear from uh, later today. And uh, finally, um, uh, our folks at uh, UNCG, uh, Nick Eberles and Sanja Knowles, uh, Ajay and uh, Ann Jane uh, from the fourth gen uh, macrocycle um, uh, computational work. And uh, finally, from our own group here at, at UNC uh, Wilmington, uh, Drug Discovery Group, um, and, um, our, our group, uh, Jeremy Morgan, who uh, really did most of the synthetic work for the, the cannabinoid work. Uh, Hold Gordon and, and, and Jared Wood, uh, graduate students in our group, and then of course uh, Stu Parnham, our, our contact UNC Chapel Hill, who's an invaluable um, uh, resource for uh, all of our NMR. And uh, I'd like to thank you all for, for your attention and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions.